So I just want to say a few words about what I mean by Holocaust memory. 41% of Americans, 66% of millennials can't say what Auschwitz was. A lot of Jewish leaders in this country, where they lack a spine, and they aren't willing to say, you know what, the Holocaust was different. It was unique. There's nothing like it. Uh, the Holocaust was the worst a spasm of anti-Semitism, of murder, of violence against Jews. Um, but there have been many. The concept of Holocaust memory, it's not just merely remembering the Holocaust happened. It's having a memory or an understanding of interpretations of this event and what it means. Before I introduce our two distinguished guests, I'd like to acknowledge Shmuley Hecht and Shabtai, uh, the organization known when I was at Yale as the High Society. Shabtai is a nonprofit dedicated to preserving the cultural heritage of Jewish communities, promoting Jewish education and scholarship, and fostering a deeper understanding of Jewish history and culture. I fondly remember evenings of camaraderie and deep conversations on Crown Street, uh, and my father and I are honored to have collaborated with you on this discussion today. Thank you, Shmuley and Toby, and everyone at Shabtai for continuing to foster this community. Oh. That one's for their system. This one's through our system, so they can hear you in the back. Oh, sorry. Cool. <laughs> I can take it. I got a press conference going on here. Um, <laughs> Uh, so thank you for uh, convening this amazing group of people and for these important discussions. Uh, we are privileged to be hosting this dialogue today in the historic President Wilson House, a site of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, this is a place that holds great significance for those of us who are dedicated to preserving the legacy of great leaders and thinkers. This was the private residence of Woodrow Wilson between 1921, when he retired from public life as the 28th president of the United States until his death in 1924. And it stands today as a testament to his life and his legacy. Uh, thank you to the executive director here, Elizabeth Karcher, my mother, uh, and to the entire Woodrow Wilson House staff for helping put this together. In many ways, today's discussion represents the idea that the preservation of history is essential to our understanding of the present and our vision for the future. As we gather here today, it is more important than ever to consider the intersection of historical memory, human rights, and social justice. In a time when <laughs> questions of equality, dignity, and freedom are at the forefront of public discourse, the insights and perspectives of each of our guests tonight are of particular relevance. So without further ado, it is my privilege today to introduce Dr. Walter Reich, Professor of Psychiatry at George Washington University, Senior Scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center, and former Director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, where he played a crucial role in shaping the institution's mission and programs. His contributions to Holocaust and genocide education have been invaluable, and his efforts to fight for human rights tireless. Leading the dialogue today will be DC's very own Jamie Kerchick, an award-winning journalist, author, and commentator who has become a prominent voice in discussions about LGBTQ rights and issues. Through his book, Secret City, the, His the Hidden History of Gay Washington, he sheds light on the rich and often untold history of the LGBTQ community. With the insights and perspectives of Walter Reich and Jamie Kerchick, today's discussion promises to be a thought-provoking and inspiring exploration of some of the most important issues facing the Jewish community and the wider world today. We are honored to have you with us today, and I am grateful to Shabtai for your role in making this discussion possible. So let us now gather in this historic home in the spirit of remembrance and renewal as we explore the legacy of the past and chart a course for the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you to <clears throat> Rabbi Shmuley for hosting us and his wonderful wife, Toby. You, you can hear me, yes? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, you can say it again. Thank you to, <laughs> <laughs> thank you to this, uh, to our hosts as well. This is a beautiful home I've never been to, even though I live just a couple blocks away. So I thought the way we would begin is with Professor Reich making some introductory comments, then I'm going to maybe respond and we'll engage in a dialogue for about 45 minutes and then open it up to questions. So without further ado. 
Thank you, Jamie. Um, some of you may have noticed uh, St. Peter here. Uh, he's praying for a good discussion. <laughs> and he's not so sure. Um, but um, uh, with divine grace, we will. And I hope, I hope uh, we do. We have some difficult things to talk about. Uh, some complicated things, um, and some perhaps unanswerable things. So uh, with St. Peter's uh, intervention, maybe we will get through this. Uh, uh, and with your help, we'll get through this uh, evening successfully, and certainly with Jamie's help. And I thank Shmuley as well. Shmuley, uh has done remarkable things uh, at Yale and New Haven. Uh, he's brought all of you together. Um, and uh, uh, this was actually my own daughter, was in the class of 2000, uh, near the beginning of Shmuley's um, uh, presence at Yale. And uh, my granddaughter, uh, this, the daughter of my son Danny, who was class of 2000 and, I mean, 1993. Um, uh, my granddaughter, uh, Josie, is there now, and she's already benefited from Shatta. Uh, so thank you all for being here this evening um, to talk about Holocaust memory. The title, Holocaust Memory Now More Than Ever, is actually Shmuley's title. Um, I provided the first half, he provided the second. Um, and it's a pleasure to see you all here, to see a number of my former students here, um, to see colleagues, to see friends, and to see people I've never met before. And I'm grateful to see all of you all. Those who have been my students have been my teachers. Um, uh, my uh, Colleagues have been my teachers, uh, and I hope uh, I will feel um, the uh, benefit of uh, all of you being my teachers. So I just want to say a few words about what I mean by Holocaust memory. Uh, when I use that phrase, um, I'm talking about the uh, public consciousness of the Holocaust. There are, of course, many publics. There's, first of all, is the American public, which is made up of many publics um, itself. There are foreign publics. There are uh, 190, 200 countries in the world. Um, and uh, each one is a public. And each public is, is divided up into sub-publics. Some have never heard of the Holocaust. Some have heard of it very well. Some feel that it's important, some people, some, um, uh, as we may discuss, um, don't like it very much. Um, and uh, there are children who, uh, who uh, may or may not know about the Holocaust. There are adults uh, who may or may not know about the Holocaust. Um, so I'd like to explore uh, what Holocaust memory is and why I think it's important, especially in our time. Uh, Holocaust memory in this country uh, became um, increasingly a topic of public awareness and discussion in the 1970s, um, after it had been either suppressed or uh, not discussed much before, to some extent because of a television miniseries uh, that occurred at that time. Um, and uh, it was a miniseries that was put on after the miniseries Roots, which increased awareness of, uh, of the black experience and the origins of, um, of uh, uh, the experience of blacks in this country. Um, and after that, uh, the Holocaust, uh, Holocaust awareness became 
more um, striking, and eventually the Holocaust Museum itself was built partly because of that. Um, but the Holocaust, Holocaust memory uh, has also had um, enemies. And there are a diff bunch of different kinds of enemies. There are destructive en enemies who would like to tear it apart, um, people motivated by anti-Semitism, um, people motivated by uh, competitive victimization. My Holocaust was worse than your Holocaust. Um, uh, efforts by countries that don't like the fact that in a number of countries in which the Holocaust took place, there were collaborators who participated in murdering Jews um, and who want to sanitize their histories um, and uh, celebrate some of the collaborators as heroes. Perhaps we'll talk about that later. Um, and increasingly uh, anti-Zionism, which um, um, which uh, in which some anti-Zionists um, um, see the Holocaust as something that caused damage to um, other people. Um, and the methods they use um, include denial, never happened, minimization, okay, it happened, but maybe you know, one million, two million, not six million, <coughs> or Holocaust conversion, uh, that the Jews are the new Nazis. Um, there are uh, dissipative enemies. Uh, first of all, simple forgetting, passage of time. Um, the sense the Jews should get over it already. Uh, Holocaust fatigue. I've heard enough about it. There are instrumental enemies. Um, the readiness of governments to use the Holocaust for political or military or diplomatic ends. This took place during the Clinton administration. Um, Clinton, for example, justified military intervention in Yugoslavia or the former Yugoslavia, uh, by pointing to the Holocaust. He also, uh, members of it, his administration tried to use the Holocaust Museum to manip manipulate public opinion. Um, there are also well-meaning, but still damaging enemies. The, the Jewish need to universalize the Holocaust by offering it to the world as a gift of the Jews. Um, uh, so, um, uh, in doing that, uh, and in focusing on the Holocaust experience, they would stress the uh, idea of never again, the vow of never again, uh, feeling that if they've just focused on themselves, on the particularities of the Holocaust, and didn't deal with the issue of never again, and, and its lessons for the whole world, um, they wouldn't be taking part in what is called tikkun olam, the repair of the world. Um, and also the idea that uh, uh, if they only focused on themselves, then others wouldn't be interested. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, it started back in, I think, 1948 when... Can people hear me, by the way? You can pull the mic a little bit closer to you. Can you? All right. Thank you. <coughs> when... Um, much better. Much better. Much better. <laughs> All right. Uh, your name again? <laughs> <laughs> you should have told me Better. before. <laughs> so, um, in 1948, the, uh, the Nazi hunter, the first one, Simon Wiesenthal, um, said that... Um, 
there were 11 million victims of the Holocaust. So, some years later, a great Holocaust historian, Yehuda Bauer, asked him, uh, Mr. Wiesenthal, you're doing great things, uh, but where'd you come up with the number 11 million? And he said, well, when I used to talk about the 6 million Jews, nobody was interested. So I said, well, there were 5 million others. Uh, and then people became interested. That's where the number 11 million comes from. And uh, I teach a class in Holocaust memory, and very often when I ask students how many Jews, were, how many people were killed in Holocaust, it was 11 million. Um, also, it's evident in um, the career of the, uh, the de-Judaized version uh, of Anne Frank's history. Uh, if you read her redacted diary, or watch the even more bodlerized stage version of the Diary of Anne Frank, one would be hard-pressed to understand exactly why and was in hiding. Um, and in fact, if you go to the Anne Frank house, it's hard to, to find out. It's not clear. Uh, her father felt that, he, that non-Jews wouldn't be interested. Um, so he made an effort uh, to de-Judaize uh, her history. Um, when the Holocaust, Holoc the Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum was opened, um, Elie Wiesel spoke and he said, the Holocaust wasn't about man's inhumanity to man. He said, no, it was about man's inhumanity to Jews. And a writer, uh, Henrik Greenberg, said, the Holocaust wasn't shared by us then, and it shouldn't be shared by us now. So some might argue, in addition to never again, the vow should also be, at least equally, zchor, remember, and should be directed not only to the world, but also to the Jews as a warning. Um, and I think it's important to remember also that um, in our own country, uh, when we um, were faced with what probably was as close to the Holocaust as any genocide um, <clears throat> in our century, um, we did, our UN representative did everything she could, that was at Madeleine Albright, to stop the world from stopping the Rwanda genocide. And when she was asked later why she did that, she said, well, I was following instructions. Um, I think she lost three grandparents uh, in the Holocaust. Um, so at the threshold uh, of forgetting as we are, uh, we should be aware of polls. In a 2018 survey carried out by the Conference on Jewish Material Claims against Germany, uh, it was found that many Americans, adult, uh, many Americans adult lack basic knowledge of what happened. And this lack of knowledge is more pronounced among millennials, whom the survey defined as people who are between ages 18 and 34, 31% of Americans, 41% of millennials believed that two million or fewer Jews were killed in the Holocaust. The actual number, of course, is around six million. 41% of Americans, 66% of millennials can't say what Auschwitz was, and 52% of Americans wrongly think that Hitler came to power through force. So, why, especially now, um, should we fight the enemies of Holocaust memory? First of all, because of the resurgence of anti-Semitism, <coughs> which is huge. Um, perhaps we could talk a little bit about that later. Um, uh, 
And it's important to remember that anti-Semitism has a very, very long history. It's, it's more than 2,000 years old. Uh, the Holocaust was the worst uh, spasm of anti-Semitism, of murder, of violence against Jews. Um, but there have been many. Um, for example, in 1919, just a few years before the Holocaust itself, uh, about 100,000 Jews were murdered in southern Poland and Ukraine. Um, I know this partly because uh, I remember a story my father told me. Uh, he was born in southern Poland, in Galicia, and on the uh, day of his bar mitzvah, uh, he was born. Uh, he was born in uh, in 1906. Uh, on the day of his bar mitzvah. Um, uh, which was a simple affair in those days. Some of you have gone to Bar Mitzvah's uh, elaborate events. <laughs> uh, then the boy was called up to read the Torah, a portion of the Torah, and they would have um, afterward a little table like this, which would have a kiddush, it would have a little glass of schnapps, and uh, if the family had some money, there was a little bit of cake and maybe even herring. Um, uh, so the table was laid out, and then all of a sudden somebody <coughs> screamed, um, they're killing Jews. So everybody scattered. And uh, then they couldn't find my father, little boy, you know, age 13. And it was only after the Sabbath that they found him hiding under the table. Uh, I was able to look up the history of that day in the Yiskra book, the Remembrance book, for that town, um, and uh, was able to corroborate, in fact, that there was a pogrom in that town as part of those 100,000 Jews. So, violent spasms in which Jews got murdered uh, were not confined to the Holocaust. The Holocaust was the worst such violent spasm. Um, so, what I'd like to do um, this evening is for us to talk about the relationship between Holocaust memory and um, the uh, issue of the rise of, of anti-Semitism, to talk about the question of whether um, knowing about the Holocaust can help contend with this rise. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, grateful to Jamie and to all of you for enabling us to talk about these issues. And I uh, hope we have a fruit, I'm sure we'll have a fruitful discussion. And I'm sure that at, by the end, St. Peter will be more relaxed. <laughs> Thank you, Walter, for those remarks. Um, I didn't really prepare a speech, so I thought I would just maybe ask you some questions and we can take it from there. You mentioned that, well, first of all, I just wanted to say that I think it's really important to understand this concept of Holocaust memory. It's not just merely remembering the Holocaust happened, and it's not just remembering certain facts and figures. Uh, it's not just remembering certain facts and figures like, you know, 6 million versus 11 million, how many millions died at Auschwitz versus other, con other camps. It's, it's having a memory or an understanding of interpretations of this event and what it means. And that there have been so many misinterpretations floating around over the past 75 years. Almost from the end, like from the moment the Holocaust ended, there were these alternative explanations, right? So the Soviet Union promoted its own interpretation where they were the first to de-Judaize the Holocaust because they didn't want to focus on the Jews as victims. They wanted to portray the Holocaust as, in, in, in Nazi fascism as a, a logical endpoint of, of capitalism. Uh, and the fact that the Jews were the chief and primary victims 
and that anti-Semitism was what created the Holocaust, was not something that the Soviet Union was interested in promoting. And you can, the Auschwitz Memorial was constructed by communists. And so it's, um, you can see that, the, the remnants of that interpretation are there. Obviously it's been updated and changed and it's a much more appropriate um, memorialization now, but the way in which the Soviet Union memorialized across uh, the, the great expanse of, of its former territories it was completely at odds mm -hmm. with, as, as we understand, understand it, in the West. Um, and I see it, we see it a lot today. The Holocaust has become a commodity for <coughs> political actors to use for their own political purposes. So I think most recently and most notoriously has been the rhetoric from some you know, anti-vaccine activist types who would compare vaccine mandates and various measures regarding COVID. You know, being forced to wear a mask is like being in Auschwitz. Um, and some of these people were serious. They weren't just joking. They were, they were seriously making these, these arguments. On the left, I recall uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez remarking after a visit to some migrant detention centers on the border with Mexico. She said that they were concentration camps. And the Holocaust Memorial Museum actually made a rare intervention. They put out a statement saying this is an, inappro this is an inappropriate invocation of the Holocaust. And interestingly, there was a group of very distinguished historians actually who attacked the Holocaust Museum, accusing the Holocaust Museum of politicizing the Holocaust. <laughs> um, so there's just a lot of this floating around and I think it, it really cheapens the events um, and the phenomena that led to the murder of six million Jews within living memory. Um, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned the Clinton administration using the Holo President Clinton invoking the Holocaust to justify the intervention in Yugoslavia. But on the other hand, you also criticized Madeleine Albright for sounding as if she, <laughs> sounding as if she was just following orders in, in her defense um, <coughs> for not doing more to prevent the Holocaust, sorry, to, to prevent the genocide in Rwanda. So I want to know, when do you think it's appropriate for political leaders in 2023 to talk about the Holocaust, the lessons of the Holocaust, when, when talking about um, crises, conflicts, potential genocides, ongoing genocides in our world today that might not have anything to do with Jews or the state of Israel? Is it ever appropriate? Because there were a lot of people in Europe, many of them Jews, Jewish intellectuals, who said, this, this, if this is allowed to proceed, if the Serbs are allowed to proceed with what they're trying to do, this would be the first genocide on European so soil since the Holocaust. And this is something that we can't allow to happen. Was that, a, was that, an, in, was that an inappropriate, do you think, abuse of Holocaust memory? Or? Um, I think Clinton wanted to go into Yugoslavia. And I think he reached for uh, the Holocaust analogy uh, as a justification. Uh, and you ask a very, uh, uh, a very difficult question. Because if the Holocaust is simply unlike anything else, then you can't um, I got I, yeah, I have I have a voice problem. You <laughs> <laughs> have a mic problem. <laughs> no, I have. I have voice is great. I have a very soft voice. Um, so, if uh, if it's simply unlike anything else, then it's out there, and and you can't compare it, compare anything else to it. So, how can you draw lessons? What lessons? Uh, if nothing else is like it. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, you want to be able to learn something about it, from uh, something from it that can be applied to the kinds of people, uh, to, to all of us, uh, to nations, to people, to individuals, uh, in uh, uh, 
a very interesting, important book, uh, Ordinary Men, 1993, I believe. Uh, a scholar named uh, Christopher um, Browning. Brown. Browning. Browning, right. Um, examine the case of um, 500 members of Battalion 101 um, who were from Hamburg, I believe, um, who uh, were druggists and pharmacists, uh, dock workers, uh, who were over 35, too old to be in the Wehrmacht in the German army, and they followed the Wehrmacht um, as it went through Poland. And their job was in a certain area uh, to either put Jews into cattle cars, uh, to be sent to death camps for gassing, or uh, if they, they were too far away from uh, railway stations just to shoot them. So these were ordinary men. They were not, uh, you know, even sort of... They weren't members of the Nazi party. They were not members of the Nazi party. And, uh, and yet they behaved this way. There were a few who wouldn't shoot, but almost all did. And nothing happened to the ones who didn't shoot. Um, so what can we learn about human behavior from this kind of, this, this, this example? We can learn a lot. We can learn that you, human beings can adapt to this kind of, this kind of murderous behavior. Um, we don't need the Holocaust to know that genocides can take place. Uh, what happened in Rwanda was not gas chambers. They, they weren't set up for that. But they ordered, as I recall, 300,000 machetes to, uh, uh, to be used by people who went around killing other people. Um, and, and that became the genocide of Rwanda. Uh, so human beings are capable of these things. And uh, I think that it was shameful for Madeleine Albright to follow those orders. Um, and I think we can learn that, and she should have learned that. Interestingly, after that, she was she she edited a, edited a book on genocide under the auspices and was published by, if I recall, the Holocaust Museum. <laughs> it was like she entered the mikvah, the ritual bath, <laughs> and was cleansed. Um, she is uh, a hero, or as they used to say, heroine, of, um, of uh, American foreign policy. But people who are in those positions um, all of a sudden become people in those positions and behave in certain ways that they should have learned they shouldn't behave. Um, I want to read a little small portion of an editorial that was published in an American newspaper, the Louisville Courier jur Journal. It was published, I believe, on Holocaust Remembrance Day. And it was co-written by five local personalities, figures, not all of whom were Jews, maybe only one or two. And the headline of this was, Holocaust Remembrance Day is a time to remember more than one atrocity. These are just a couple of excerpts. Jews do not have a monopoly on persecution and atrocities. International Holocaust Day is not just a mantra about one Jewish Holocaust, but about every genocide, every mass tyranny that is carried out upon any group based on skin color, religion, gender identity, and ethnic background. We must not forget nor suppress the truths of all those crimes that happened and are still happening. Hitler was just one of many dictators. The list of tyrants, past and present, continues with the addition of names from around the globe today. These autocrats masquerade as religious leaders or elected officials, grandstanding with, worth, with worthless facts and solutions to non-existent problems, like teaching about race in schools and banning books. So 
Well, how do you respond to that? That essentially Ron DeSantis is Adolf Hitler. That seems to be the that seems to be the conclusion. That seems to be the conclusion that's being put forward by, by, by that. And this is not some hyperbolic, silly right. argument. This was published by five local upstanding pillars of the community in Louisville. And, go, yeah, go ahead. So, you know, with most, with much of that, I don't have a problem. Uh, with much of that, uh, I can certainly, I, I can certainly agree that uh, we have to be on guard and uh, with, with respect to uh, the importance of um, of uh, um, of not doing terrible damage to individual groups, some of it like Ron DeSantis and the issue of books and pushing everything into that basket, uh, I don't agree, and I don't agree in general with the effort to say it's all the same. Say that again, welcome. I don't agree with the effort to say that it's all the same. Okay. That every genocide is the same. Every well. genocide is the same. Every crime against humanity is the same. Uh, they're not all the same. Uh, as it happens, the Holocaust was, I mean, I don't know about a very ancient history, you know, pre-recorded history, but since the recording of history, it's probably the greatest and certainly the most focused genocide um, that has ever taken place. Uh, but uh, to say that they're all the same, I think, uh, makes um, the Holocaust into less than it actually was. What is the impact of that? Because some might say, well, this is all in the past, and we want to be able to not use the Holocaust, but we want to uh, be able to discuss it so that we can prevent harm committed against other groups. What is the actual, what are the actual consequences of allowing these sorts of efforts, like minim minimization or comparing it to other contemporary events? How does it actually have a real world impact? Well, if you, in the process of trying to universalize, um, uh, in the process of trying to uh, apply the word Holocaust or the example of the Holocaust to uh, everything else, um, if in that process uh, you, you end up having to minimize the Holocaust, uh, seeing it's like everything else, then you're um, engaging in a dissolution of the Holocaust. And I think it's really important to be able to uh, understand every instance on its own, um, uh, on the basis of its own reality. And this was the worst such in instance. You've been teaching the Holocaust for decades at the university level. Right. Why, what have we been doing wrong in this country and also around the world that we see these numbers that you cited earlier about, and I, there are worse figures. There are people who think that the Jews committed the Holocaust, right. honestly believe this. They think, you know, they thought Hitler was the victim. They don't, they know nothing. Right. What are we doing wrong as a country and as a global community if you like, that these, that, that this is allowed to persist? <clears throat> um, well, I think you just made a case for um, raising the question of whether learning about the Holocaust makes a difference. Whether repeating the, for the vow never again makes a difference. Uh, I, think, I think that Holocaust education uh, makes some difference. Uh, but I think a number of matters also make a difference. One is the persistence of anti-Semitism, um, which sort of took a vacation after 1945, uh, as if 
anti-Semitism got so exhausted by the violence, by the extent and nature of the violence, um, but that got revived um, gradually. Um, and uh, it's a good question as to whether Holocaust education um, is enough to change the career, the trajectory, the nature of, of uh, anti-Semitism. Um, but I think it's better than nothing. How much did Jewish organizations and Jewish communities and Jewish leaders, how much should they be blamed, do you think? Because it seems that there's a real lack of maybe self-assertiveness in speaking out when these sorts of minimum, mi minimum, minimizations and obfuscations occur, these episodes occur, it seems that the leading Jewish organizations are tripping, you know, head over heels to universalize. Mm -hmm. um, that there's something about a lot of Jewish leaders in this country where they lack a spine and they aren't willing to say, you know what, the Holocaust was different, it was unique. There's nothing like it. There was never an industrialized modern society that tried to exterminate an entire people like Germany in that period of time. You know what? This isn't an appropriate comparison to be making, you, you know, members of other ethnic or minority groups. It seems that there's a real inhibition among Jewish leaders and that they, to a large extent, I think, share some of the blame right. for this. Do you? I, I agree. I agree, Jamie. Um, as... Uh, one of your elder colleagues, journalist, um, Ed Rothstein, has written. Um, who, he was the culture critic of the New York Times. He's now the culture critic of the Wall Street Journal. Um, there's a remarkable difference between identity museums um, of other groups, uh, whether they're Native Americans or African Americans. They don't seem to have a sense of a need to um, uh, to uh, deal with other victimizations. But Jews seem to have a need to, to deal with the whole world's victimization, wherever it may take place. Uh, and again, to um, treat the Holocaust as if it's, they can only talk about it if, if, if it can teach about the world. And that, as I said earlier, it's a gift of the Jews. So I can turn the question, Jamie, around to you and also to the group. What's wrong with the Jews? <laughs> what, I mean, what, what, why, 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 why are Jews like that? Um, uh, we have in the audience somebody who just snickered, who uh, I'd like to ask him. Uh, uh, Michael Foyer is Dean of the School of Education. Uh, aren't you sorry you came? <laughs> no, Michael? No. He's the Dean of the School of Education and Human Development and a dear friend uh, at GW. Um, and he has an interest in all kinds of education, including Jewish education. Um, why, why do you think this happens, Michael? It is a... I, I, I did have some uh, experience in improvisational theater, but nothing to prepare me for that. Um, yes, sir. Just the <laughs> There's no free lunches. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, first of all, it's very nice to be here with friends and especially with Walter and Jamie Kirchig. I've been reading you for a long time, oh, so it's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, and I was counting how long it would take before somehow the education system would be held accountable for the, the obvious uh, disappointment that we see in these data about how few people know Auschwitz and know other things that for many of us, I suspect, are very uh, much etched in our 
memory, if not in our daily consciousness. So I don't have a good answer to that. I do remember a former editor of the New Republic back in the 1980s pointed out that something like 40% of the graduates of Harvard University couldn't name the two senators from their home state. And I always remember that because I think one needs to approach this question of how un undereducated we are with a little bit of humility. Or just, or just Harvard graduates. Or just Harvard <laughs> graduates. So I know I'm, I, there's some Yale types here, and that's, I, I thought that would go over well. Can I ask a question while I've been put in this awkward position of um, holding the microphone, or yeah, do you want to sure. wait until? No, no, we can start now. I mean, I, I, yeah, go ahead. I, I'm, would either of you want to comment on the uh, potential paradox that Zionism was on the one hand, of course, predated the Shoah by many decades, but is viewed by many people, the project, the Zionist project, as being the ultimate, one of the two possible solutions to the situation that led to the possibility of the Holocaust. The other being, in the good days, the American pluralist model and the Israeli sovereignty model were the, were, were the two. But Zionism was clearly one of the hoped for solutions. And when you talk to contemporary Israelis who are the living embodiment of the Zionist project and its success, you get a lot of resistance to this um, dwelling on the memory of the Shoah. Any, any reflections on that? Um, well, I'm not really an expert on contemporary Israeli society, but I do know that Holocaust victims, sorry, Holocaust survivors, had a lot of, had a lot of challenges in Israel because they were sort of reminders. Mm -hmm. They were seen as weak uh, or, or as kind of living reminders of the weakness of the Jews, which is terrible when you think about it. I mean, of all places where Holocaust survivors should not have to put up with yeah. discrimination and, and prejudice should be in Israel, right? Um, I don't think... Just, th just uh, to give, give yeah. an example of that, um, there was one survivor who reminded me some years ago, uh, he became a psychiatrist, came to America, uh, trained in psychiatry. He survived Warsaw by posing as a non-Jew, uh, moved to Israel, um, 48 maybe, went to medical school there, uh, and said that uh, Sabras, who had been living in right. Israel, uh, referred to him and to fellow survivors yeah. as Sabonim as pieces of soap. Right, yes. Oh yeah, that was quite common. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also, if you talk to many Israelis today, obviously they uphold their country as living proof of why it's necessary to have a Jewish state. And they often <laughs> will, I think over the past couple of years too, as we've seen increasing anti-Semitism in this country, there's been some kind of, satis I don't know if satisfaction isn't the right word, because obviously they're very worried and concerned. But there is a sense that, you know what, you American Jews thought you had it so good, you thought you had this great existence that you were riding high, and you, you, know, you supported us, but you also kind of looked down on us. And now, now what do you think? Now the tables have been turned. And I remember distinctly, I think it was two years, was it last May when there were those uh, eruptions? in Los Angeles and on the streets of New York City, which, I mean, I, I don't think that had ever happened in America before. You know, just pogroms, right, in Times Square and in the streets of Los Angeles. I mean, just, you know, groups of young Muslim men looking for Jews to hunt down and kill, something you would expect to see in a European city. And I, I think particularly after that moment was a, was a very um, important one, sort of the relationship between the diaspora Jewish community in America and, and Israeli Jews. Um, I mean, I don't think there's much of a future for Jewish life in Europe. 
I mean, it's a dwindling, dwindling populations in all those countries. Um, I still like to think that, and I still do believe that uh, America is a great place for Jews. Um, but I will not lie if I were not saying that I, I don't think Israel is looking like an increasingly attractive option to a, to a lot of American Jews. Not only, because, not only because of what's happening in America, but also what's happening in Israel. I mean, we're not talking about the current Israeli government and all that, but in terms of Israel's position in the region is so much stronger than it was 15 years ago, 20 years ago, in terms of just its diplomatic position, the relationships with the Arab, with the Arab countries, the fact that the Palestinian issue is really not doesn't represent, um, a th there, there really isn't a major terrorist threat emerging from the Gaza Strip and the West Bank like there was in the, you know, 20 years ago during the Second Intifada, so. Uh, and there's another dimension to that. Um, there's a common mantra in Iran, um, as there is in other Muslim countries, um, but especially in Iran, in which, um, there's a notion that it's terrific that half the world's Jews are yeah. in Israel. Uh, as, I forget who, I think Rafsan Jani said, uh, Israel is a, a, a one-bomb one country. Bomb country. Yeah. yeah, you remember that too, huh? A one-bomb country. Um, so the advantages, in a way, that Jews had being a diasporic population following the expulsion, mm. the Roman expulsion, uh, living in so many different places, getting pogromed here and there. Mm. Uh, uh, that was in a way an advantage because if people inject, if, the, if the, the normal set point is you, kill, you blame the Jews for something, you kill them every once in a while. Well, if you kill them here, there's still Jews there. Um, and um, now, half of them are in Israel. Speaking of Israel, when, when you see a prime minister like Benjamin Netanyahu, um, when he's engaging in friendly diplomatic relations with, say, right-wing nationalist leaders in Europe, like, say, Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, or the Polish government, and these are governments that are engaged in various forms of, not Holocaust denial, but Holocaust obfuscation, perhaps, denying their own country's responsibility. Do you think that that is a betrayal of his role as the, basically the leader, not the leader of the Jewish people, but the leader of the Jewish state, and all that that implies in terms of, I think there is some responsibility in being the Prime Minister of Israel and sort of protecting the memory of the Holocaust. Do you think that that is a betrayal of that trust and that duty that he has, or do you think this is sort of the grubby the grubby dealings that you have to engage in when you are the leader of a state, and that, and that it's not your role to say, to, to scold the leader of Hungary for building a, a monument to Hungarian fascists or whatnot. Uh, I'm, I would be a lousy, <laughs> I'd be a lousy politician. I'd be a lousy um, uh, head of state for Israel or any other country, uh, because I would have a hard time um, doing the kinds of things that uh, leaders have to do. Uh, because I, I mean, I'd be out of there. I'd be um, unable to lead because I'd be unable to engage in the kind of diplomatic stuff that sometimes you have to up to a point. Uh, you know, when it comes to a point. And, you know, if it, if it comes to the to the military point of I don't know, engaging in a non-provoked, uh, um, non-provoked violence against people, um, I wouldn't be able to do that. But uh, if it involves uh, uh, talking to people I don't particularly want to talk to, who've done things I really find. A, objectionable, it would be harder for me than I think it would be for a lot of people to um, to sort of suck it up and do it. Um, so I'm glad I'm not in that position. <laughs> and I have a feeling Jamie uh, 
you would have a problem as well. Yes. That's why I'm never running for political office. That and other reasons. Are there other questions? Wait, let's pass the mic yeah. around. So. Why don't you introduce yourself? Yes, and please introduce yourself. And maybe we should do this. We'll start with the front and move the mic backwards. So if there's anybody in this row, you can pass it through. Thank you, Shmuley. Um I don't know yeah. if this is working, but... Speak up. Yes, of course. It's, it's for the... It's, it's, it's just for the recording. So you have to speak up as if it's not like Of course. Thank you. Um, my name is Arjun Singh, and my question is somewhat of a corollary on what was just mentioned about Zionism and Israel in particular. And before that, Professor Jamie, that was an excellent discussion. Thank okay. you for your remarks. Um, one of the long-running contemporary debates surrounding the issue of anti-Semitism has been where do you draw the line between anti-Semitism on the one hand and political criticism of the state of Israel for its actions in respect of the Israel-Palestine issue and some of the political circumstances surrounding its creation on the other. And in that context, um, the International Holocaust Remembrance Association's definition of anti-Semitism has been somewhat controversial in respect of this debate. It defines anti-Semitism um, as including anti-Zionism. And there are many people who argue that, no, that's not the case. So what is your opinion about this controversy? What do you think about the IHRA's definition? And if you agree with it, then what's your argument to people for why anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism? And that should be the baseline of their understanding. So maybe we could each of us mm -hmm. uh, respond. But uh, allow me to allow me to respond now. Um, Go ahead. Um, the, um, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance has uh, created a definition of anti-Semitism that is actually on, that has been adopted by thirty, I think, thirty-eight, thirty-seven countries, uh, well over a thousand entities, universities, companies uh, uh, around the world, uh, and it gives a definition and gives working examples of what, what, what anti-Semitism is. And when it comes to the issue of anti-Zionism, uh, it says anti-Zionism uh, is anti-Semitism. Anti-Zionism is often a cover for anti-Semitism. Um, people who are um, anti-Semitic are able, some people, this is not all of the anti-Zionists don't fall into this category, but uh, all anti-Semites are anti-Zionists. <laughs> well, that's uh, not true. There are some anti-Semites who are uh, Zionists. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> on the far, on the far right. The far I mean, right. There are some far right and people I would consider anti-Semites. An interesting story about that. When, when uh, there was a uh, convention of. Uh, excuse me, St. Peter, just... Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's a, there was a convention of, um, uh, of uh, evangelicals in Jerusalem um, years ago when Menachem Begin was the Prime Minister. Uh, and Begin was invited to speak. Uh, and one of his aides said, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, don't you understand that they believe that um, uh, after the war between uh, Gog and Magog, um, uh, um, and when the second coming occurs, um, uh, all Jews will convert, and if they don't convert, they will be bathed in a lake of fire. And his response, Bacon's response was, I'll worry about it when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as a, that's just an aside, forgive me. The, um, I think the, the central message of the IRA definition, which I believe ought to be the definition of anti-Semitism is that when 
people start dealing with Israel in a way that they, that they wouldn't deal with, with any other country. Uh, when they single out Israel for behaviors that don't even occur to them with regard to other countries, that's anti-Semitism. Um, when, do you remember the last um, demonstration against uh, the occupation of Tibet. How many people here? I mean, Tibet is how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times the, si the size of the West Bank. Um, it is now mostly Han Chinese. It got um, Han Chinese were paid extra to be able to move into Tibet. And I remember once being in the Chinese um, embassy um, and talking with a the military attaché, and I reminded him of this, and he said, I said, well, you know, Tibet is China's West Bank. He said, what? And I started looking for the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just a few blocks away from here, I think. Um, I, we don't demonstrate against Tibet. We don't demonstrate against, uh, there, there are some focus on the Uyghurs at the moment, but I'm just picking on China. There are other places in the world as well. Um, and, um, and in general, the, I, my answer to your question is that I think is a very, very important, very good document, and I wish my university would adopt it. I wish many other universities would adopt it. I would put it right at the top of the list in terms of of what uh, should be done by any organization. Um, I think unless you don't believe in nations at all, in sort of an academic sense, and there are, there are some people, I guess, who don't believe in nations at all, then I can't see how it isn't anti-Semitic to be an anti-Zionist, to say that there's only one country in the world that doesn't deserve to exist, and it's the Jewish one. To me, that seems pretty clear-cut definition of anti-Semitism. Right? That too, I agree. <laughs> Hi, my name's Shana. That was an excellent conversation. Um, I'm a journalist, and I often notice that um, when I'm given a story to read on air, and it's about the Holocaust, I have to insert something about the Jews in it, and the people that are writing it are not malicious or even ignorant. It's just become, like you said, a sort of a universal term for genocide. Um, I have. Two questions. One, I lived in Israel for many years. I served in the army. I was friends with a lot of Israelis. And I, there's a fatigue there, too, about the Holocaust. Somebody mm -hmm. said the term the Holocaust industrial complex when I was there, how sort of like politicians there use it cynically when they want to distract from social issues to attack somewhere else or, or something like that. Um, just your thoughts on that. And then the other question, um, when it comes to education, particularly for Jewish kids, you know, I grew up, it was very present. I mean, my bags were like packed. I was ready for something terrible to happen as a kid. There were these young adult books we would read that were terrifying. So how do you sort of educate Jewish kids about it without creating another generation of neurotic, anxious Jews? <laughs> Which, it may be too late, but maybe in a way that doesn't terrify little kids about the Holocaust. So those are, those are my two questions. Well, as a psychiatrist, I believe that uh, there should be as many patients as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Um, I, uh, you know, when you, when you compare the behavior of uh, Yad Vashem, Israel's own Holocaust institution, which includes a great museum, uh, and any other uh, museum or institution, um, it's really the only one. I mean, they also use the, the, the Holocaust. Uh, they also bring heads of state into Yerusha um, and, in a sense, instrumentalize the Holocaust. But, but they should. That is part of the justification or necessity for having a state where Jews can go to um, uh, after um, after a uh, cataclysm in which Jews would, which in which Jews could not escape because they had no place to go to, uh, it helps people understand 
why uh, there is a state. One of the reasons there is a state. Um, so, and, and, and yes, um, s- students may get um, tired of hearing about it in Israel. They certainly hear that there are memorials all the time. There are days, there are days of, uh, there's Holocaust Memorial Day, which is not the International Holocaust Memorial Day, where the whole country stops. Um, people, traffic stops, people get out of there, the sirens go on, um, and they certainly learn about it. More than half the country is made up of people who are not the descendants of Ashkenazi Jews, um, who didn't have a great time in Arab countries, uh, and who got expelled or had to flee, about 800,000 of them, to Israel in 1948, 49, 50, 51, uh, who um, had very little, very little experience. Some in North Africa did have some experience with the Holocaust. Um, but in Baghdad, bef- before 1948, one out of every three people were Jews, just as in Warsaw. Um, and they left. They fled or were expelled. Um, so I think Israel has certain rights to deal with the Holocaust in ways that, and, and even instrumentalize it um, in, in, with justifications that others, I believe, do not. Jamie? I don't, I don't really have anything to add to that, but thank you. Uh, yeah. Who has the microphone? Yeah. Can I just add on, on this sure. briefly? Um, yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Jessica Roda. I'm a professor of Jewish civilization at Georgetown University. I have a question about actually um, the education part, because the, the struggle in general when we have, for instance, in Jewish studies, you know, department or in general in the field, and, and I also saw so two parts in my question, Jewish education for non-Jews and Jewish education for Jewish children. I have a little boy. Uh, he's nine years old, and um, and I'm not American. You can maybe hear in my accent. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm French. Um, but the question always about, and I believe in it, the, the the importance of the Holocaust as being part of the history. This is not something that I teach. Um, this is not at all my expertise. But there is always this tension in terms of Jewish history is much more than that. And 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 indeed, it's important. To, to, it's part of our history, but this is not only what we are, and you know, and and what we also went through. Um, so how, you know, again, you know, thinking about so many things that I heard about some American Jews like the Central, what it means to be Jewish to experience the we experience the Holocaust in Israel, but it's much more than that. And I work with Hasidic Jews, and you can see that their their experience of what is Judaism and what is Jewish is completely different than uh, I would say American liberal Judaism, where you know a sense of Jewishness is is much more in the present in the experience in the living. Not no not saying that they don't talk about the the past and the Holocaust. You know most of them are Holocaust survivors, but. How do you balance this 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 idea of remembering, but also remembering that we are here and you know we also live as as Jews and we also have to show what it means, right? Can you repeat the question, please, Jen? Please So, did, how do you reconcile this tension well, of? Uh, let me let me try. Let me try. Um, yeah, uh, could you repeat your name, Professor? You, say your oh, name again. Name Jessica, Jessica Oda. Jessica, Jessica Oda. I want you to meet another uh, French, <laughs> a former student of mine, <laughs> Emma, uh, who, uh, who's, uh, who, who studies in, the, in Sciences Po. And is, she, she's in, uh, she is a, uh, she has such a complicated last name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm French British, so there's two parts to it. Right. Um, uh, and she uh, uh, she has graced uh, GW for uh, this year. Um, 
and was a student in one of my classes last last semester on the Holocaust. Um, and I think you you ask a very very <coughs> very important very trenchant question because it seems as if uh, the whole thing about being Jewish that the question was you know dealing with the Holocaust you forget about the rest of what it is uh, regarding Jewish civilization regarding Jewish history um, Jew. Judaism is a text-based religion. It's, it, you know, it started with a book, a pretty important book. It's called the Hebrew Bible. <laughs> um, uh, there was the Ten Commandments. Uh, there, uh, and then there were commentaries, and commentaries on the commentaries, and commentaries on the commentaries on the commentary. Um, there is there's something called the Talmud. There... Uh, should I go on? There are, uh, you know, there's, there's a huge literature, um, very rich, very, very productive. Uh, Jews had experiences in many lands, as well as in their ancestral homeland, um, and uh, made huge contributions, not only in their religion, but also to the general culture and science and other fields. Um, and all of this needs to be known, and it's, it's uh, overshadowed to some extent by, um, by, this, by this tremendum, this terrible event that took place only 70, 80 years ago. Um, and it would be terrific if uh, more Jews were aware of what of the richness of that of that um, legacy, mm -hmm. and we're not only aware of it, but we learned from it, studied that stuff, uh, and uh, and they don't. Uh, and maybe if they did, uh, there would be less of a problem that now faces Jews in many countries especially perhaps in America, which is uh, basically a dissipation of, uh, through intermarriage and other means of uh, the Jewish population. Uh, if, if you're Jewish and you don't learn about this, and if you're not Jewish anymore, you're certainly not going to learn about this. And you, I mean, the, 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 uh, uh, the texts of Jewish civilization and religion uh, are really the vessel of the history. And not many people outside of yeshiva, not, people, not many people outside of Jewish institutes of learning know anything about it. And that is the, I would say, something akin to a tragedy. Uh, next question. Yeah. Hi, uh, Jonathan Esty, a PhD student at Sice Hopkins. Um, my question is about a potentially unique kind of historical culpability that the U.S. and the U.S. foreign policy establishment has for permitting the Holocaust, or shall we say doing essentially nothing to alleviate it. I think we all know some of the details about ships of refugees being turned away, uh, quotas not being raised, Roosevelt being unwilling to extend political capital on this issue, not bombing any of the train lines, going to Auschwitz is not a top military priority. Um, going back to the question about the 90s and the use or misuse of the Holocaust analogy, whether Yugoslavia or not in Rwanda, um, what comes to mind is there's always a reason not to, right? It's politically inconvenient, it's not militarily feasible, it'll cost blood and treasure. Um, I, I tend to think, as a, as a non-Jew who feels a huge amount of uh, historical guilt over the inaction of the U.S. in this moment, I tend to think that there's two sort of takeaways, one the specifically Jewish and one the universal. The specifically Jewish being support for Israel and the universal being a presumptive bias in favor of intervention, albeit messy and incomplete like in Bosnia or belated like in Kosovo, and to avoid the inaction like in Rwanda. 
Uh, I guess my question is, do you think um, you were expressing some reservations about the utility or the appropriateness of that analogy, but do you think there is something for, for non-Jews to take away um, in, in both of those spheres about a, a sense of working off an existing debt? Um, let, me, let me try this one, okay? Yeah, no, I was going to let you go first. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to go to one of my former students who I think has been raising her hand, hasn't been noticed, um, Sabrina. Uh, uh, the, um, so sometimes I um, respond to questions with stories. And so I'm thinking of a story um, that may contain part of the answer to your question. Um, one of the jobs I had, um, one of the things I used to do at the Holocaust Museum was to take people around, you know, the head of state or, um, and so on. Uh, we had a visit from, uh, from somebody you may have heard about, uh, Strzok Talbot, who used to be head of the Brookings Institution. He, he, before that he was, uh, but at the time he was deputy, I believe he was deputy secretary of state, right? And, um, and so I took him to the part of the exhibit which showed the, um, was, was about the bombing or not bombing of Auschwitz. It was right after that model of the gas chambers. And there on the, uh, on the wall was the letter from John, John McCoy, who uh, was responding to the request from the World Jewish Congress uh, that uh, that the that the railway lines be bombed, uh, and I said, uh, I said I said there, I think there was no State Department at the time. It was called something else. Uh, I said, uh, Stroke, uh, when you're signing papers. Remember that anything you sign could end up on a museum yes. wall. <laughs> and he was sort of like, um, seemed uh, a bit um, frozen. Um, but I think, in the end, individual decisions uh, may come to haunt you. And I think it's important to have in your consciousness the potential implications, the, the consequences of those decisions. Um, that's one of the use. That's one of the uses of a museum, I think, um, and of historical examples. Oh, my turn. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Sabrina Soffer. As Professor Reich said, um, I'm one of his former students. I'm also a columnist, but. I do have a couple questions, but I guess I'll just... For who? For both of you. <laughs> you said the columnists? Oh, yeah, yeah, for the Times of Israel. Oh, okay. Um, but, that, yeah, sorry. Um, okay, so I have two questions, but I'll just ask one. So in our class, um, I'm sure you guys, my other uh, former classmates remember, <laughs> we were assigned to watch the movie Denial, and it's about the case between Deborah Lipstadt, um, who is currently the envoy to monitor anti-Semitism at the State Department, and David Irving, who is a British historian, or whatever kind of historian you want to call him. But um, so basically, I guess for a little bit of context, um, Lipstadt was at, she was giving a talk, and David Irving came there, and he asked her a question, which basically implied denial of the Holocaust, and she refused to respond to the question, and it resulted in a whole, um, you know, lawsuit, and that's basically what the movie is about. So I was just wondering, how do you handle people like David Irving? Would you agree with Deborah Lipstadt and say that, you know, it's just not even worth giving them the platform to share their facts or engage with them whatsoever, or do you really give them like? you know, the light of day, and try to argue with them and, you know, get, the, get them to reason properly with the facts. And, I mean, I guess that's what the trial did in the end, and it kind of proved the legitimacy of the Holocaust, which is not what Deborah Lipstadt wanted, but, yeah, I guess that's so, my question. So, uh, first of all, I want to say that that was not required, re not required viewing <laughs> background 
he did extra work in, in this course. Um, um, the one of the things I sometimes say in my classes is, in this class, this is I, I don't use these phrases very often. This is a safe space. You can say whatever you want. You can certainly disagree with me. I want you to disagree with me and each other, uh, as long as you do it uh, in a uh, respectful way, and as long as you have some some reasoning behind your argument. Um, the only thing that exercises me uh, is when somebody, the only thing I really can't uh, abide by is when somebody says uh, and holds to the idea that it never happened. They should really drop the course and take something else. Uh, uh, I told you earlier that I answer questions sometimes with stories. I remember at the opening day of the Holocaust Museum, um, across the street, across 14th, across 15th Street, there's a near, toward the Washington Monument. There is a grassy area, and there was a circle of people uh, who were against the opening of the Holocaust Museum, and they were holding up signs. One guy, one person, had a sign saying, "The Holocaust never happened," and behind. That person, there was somebody holding up a sign saying, uh, they should have killed them all. <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's a never, never land. Uh, but people actually uh, have such views. But the question is, how do you engage them? And I think asking a historian or a journalist this question is like asking a physicist or uh, an astronomer if he should be engaging with someone who says the Earth is flat. And that's how that should be treated. Thank you. Yes, apparently, there, apparently there's some sort of speech t later tonight that some of you want to <laughs> listen to. I can't imagine why. Yes, in the front. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carl Naturno. Um, I'm wondering, in keeping with the never again idea, uh, and the rising anti-Semitism in the current moment, what lessons could we take from, I guess, the build-up to the Holocaust uh, to apply to the current historical moment to perhaps avoid uh, another tragedy, terrible tragedy, from happening? Uh, I think the dehumanizing people in your rhetoric um, that's really where this began, right, in Nazi I Germany. I, I utterly, utterly agree with yeah. this. You know that a genocide, uh, one of the signs, the earliest signs of genocide is when people are identified as less than human. It happened in Rwanda. Uh, uh, Tutsis were called Cockroaches. Cockroaches. It happens certainly in the Holocaust. Uh, and whenever you see dehumanization, you have to be alert to, uh, to, to something terrible that may be happening. It's sort of like necessary to make people into people who are less than human in order to be able to kill them. On that note, <laughs> hi. I just want to thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, my name is Toby Hecht. I am the director of Shopdai, based in New Haven. Um, I'm just going to close with a few words, if you don't mind. Hope, can you all hear me? No? Oh, no? Should I use the mic? Go ahead. Sorry. No. How about now? Better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. A few weeks ago, my sister and I took a bunch of kids to the 9-11 Memorial in New York City. On the lower level, there's a wall of squares in numerous shades of blue representing the 2,983 victims of both attacks on the World Trade Center. While Virgil's quote across the enormous body of work, quote, no day shall erase you from the memory of time, end quote, is rated controversial by classicists, Spencer Fitch, the artist, was trying to capture the memorable color of the sky that day. I couldn't help but be thrown back 
into my grandmother's story in Cluj, now Romania, then Hungary, where she hid from mid-April of 1944 until October 10th of 1944. She said it was the most beautiful sky that summer, and she couldn't understand its vibrancy, juxtaposed to her reality. A 19-year-old, separated from her family, hiding for her life in a foreign city. Much like what Spencer was trying to convey, the same incomprehensible contradiction on Tuesday morning, September 11th, 2001. Virgil's quote, according to the experts in Latin literature, said he was referring to the perpetrators of terrible deeds, not the victims. And somewhat of an understanding or compromise, perhaps was reached for the memorial, that the quote could represent both. Both the victims of 9-11 and the murderous perpetrators will not be erased from the memory of time. This duality resonates strongly within Jewish tradition of remembering evil and memorializing the victims who they murdered for simply being Jews. On the one hand, it is a commandment in the Torah, the Bible, to remember the evil of Amalek, the representation of evil in the world, every day. And every day we say it multiple times. Thou shall remember this evil and obliterate and erase it from your midst. Simultaneously, Jewish tradition teaches us to remember our predecessors by actively engaging in our Judaism. Jessica. Um, if there's one thing the Germans informed the Jewish people is that Judaism is not an identity one can slip in and out of or run away from. They threw my Hasidic great-grandparents from northern Transylvania and their families into the same gas chambers as the cosmopolitan Jewish elite of Europe. They didn't distinguish, because we, the Jewish people, are indistinguishable. At our essence, at our core, we are one with the Pentelid, the Jewish spark inside each of us, whether we feel it or we don't yet feel it, weird openly or not. My grandparents, yes, victims of the most heinous crime committed on humanity, said the answer is not to be less connected, i.e. less Jewish, but to be more, and more, and more. They doubled down on their commitment to their faith every day, because they knew this is how they were going to eternalize their brothers, sisters, parents, grandparents, and the Jewish people going all the way back to Abraham and Sarah. To be the link between the past and the future is hard, but it is the critical task at hand. That today there are students on campus in this great country, the country that gave my grandparents and so many others the opportunity to see the future, one where they could live to observe their faith publicly and with pride, only for young people to now be uncertain of that public expression, to fear consequences of alliances and free speech, to feel the need to hide what is essential to their being is unacceptable. But the answer is not to fear, or doubt, or certainly not to hide, but to stand up straight with courage and the strength of conviction. We have thousands of years of truth and tradition on our side. We need to tap into our heritage, practice with purpose, do a mitzvah, a commandment, and then another, learn and teach, and most importantly, share with love and kindness. I want to end off by thanking Alex, who is in my address. Alex and uh, Veronica. Uh, Cohen for hosting tonight, and of course, uh, we're sorry, Victoria. They say, I'm sorry, Victoria. Um, and um, Elizabeth, thank you so much. Elizabeth is the director of this wonderful home we are in. Um, and of course, um, your, your father and your husband, Arthur, uh, for hosting this beautiful event. Um, Shop that relies on the generous support of individuals and families like yourself to create welcoming spaces for meaningful, meaningful conversation and dialogue. And as Alex and uh, Victoria, our now Mary, Mazel Tov. May you be blessed to be able to do more of this mitzvah, which is opening your home, Hachnas's Arkham, whether it be in the Wilkinwood or Wilson home or your own home, to friends and strangers alike, creating an everlasting edifice, which you have begun tonight. To Walter and Jamie, as we sit here in our nation's capital, founded on the principles of liberty and justice, it is of no coincidence that you both, who have dedicated your lives to truth, memory, and continuity, have made the city your home, a place to impact the world. We are so grateful to you for taking time out of your busy schedules to share words of wisdom and brilliance with us here tonight. And I want to thank you all for being here tonight. Shopify is based in New Haven, but we are 
uh, emerging in different cities like DC and Boston and uh, New York City and Los Angeles. And uh, we invite uh, you to come and visit us in New Haven and continue to participate in our events uh, around the country and uh, the world. And um, that's really all I have to say for tonight. I know we've got a big, um, we've got a big speech tonight at night. So we're, um, I just want to echo the big thank you and a uh, big thank you to the family um, and to Alex. And I think tonight is actually a testament to um, uh, a conviction of confidence. It, the, you look at the room and the bracket, the age bracket of this room is just absolutely fascinating. From the most recent alums off of Yale's campus, students here still in college, uh, all the way to the senior faculty of some of these universities and the other states of this town. And I think that is testament to what you did tonight, we did tonight collectively. And it started with one little question by Alex a couple of weeks ago at another event of ours in DC with Dan Applebaum, where Alex said, Shmoliet, um, I want to do this. I want to host. I want to bring people together on a, an important subject and bring people together. And that's all it takes. It's one half like that. And we debated about where and how many people and what we should do about capping. And thank God this standing room only here tonight. So it's very, very special. It's that one little act that I think answers um, and echoes what Toby said, what you both spoke about tonight, of course, the, the questions. I do have a small gift um, that I brought with me from New Haven. Um, and I know, I know that uh, this is a book that Professor Reich has not read. Uh, because I asked him before I came if he read it. It's a book by the famous playwright Ben Hecht. Many of you know Ben Hecht. Um, you've all seen Scarface, so now you know who Ben Hecht is. Um, but Ben Hecht was a great hero in American history. He was a great playwright. He was a great activist uh, during and after the Holocaust. Uh, he wrote many books. You should read all of them, fiction and nonfiction. This is his greatest work. It's called The God for the Bedeviled. And I was standing in the back tonight, and when Walter said, what's wrong with the Jews? I said, oh, how funny. I know this book by heart. <laughs> and so I opened up to page three. No, I didn't see his speech. Nor did I think he was going to ask that question tonight. Well, what is wrong with, what is wrong with the Jews? <laughs> I'm a rabbi. I spent my whole life studying. What's wrong with the Jews? So I won't read the whole book to you but I will read one paragraph and hope you find the book online. I've kind of cornered the market on this, it's very expensive. Ben Heck, it's 1943. Three million Jews have been annihilated, murdered by the Germans, and sadly he senses there's more to come. He goes into a lobby of a hotel in Manhattan and has, has a conversation with a fellow literary giant of New York, and she says, I'd like to know, she went on, how do you explain the unpopularity of the Jews? I mean, what do you think it is about the Jew that makes him so constant a victim? What is it in him that attracts so much anger and arouses people everywhere? He responds with this book, A Guide for the Bedevil. It was sent to me 20 years ago by a very famous literary uh, agent in Hollywood. And um, I can't stop buying them and giving them out. So this is my gift to you. No, we're not related. My name is Shmuley. I have no knowledge. I'm not promoting the family enterprise. But <laughs> that's a gift to you. I hope, I hope you enjoy it. Um, and for Alex, I have a gift, um, which is the second half of the answer of that. Ben Heck takes his track on answering what's wrong with the Jews. The second book is for Alex. It's. <clears throat> It's a book by Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik, who was the leader of modern Orthodox Judaism and the dean of YU and the great rabbi and leader, one of the greatest Jewish leaders and intellectuals in the 20th century, Yeshua Bar Soloveitchik. And in 1956, he addressed the Orthodox Jewish population in America about their acceptance of the Zionist state, which was a modern secular state in essence. And he addresses them, and it was, this work was trans in Yiddish. It was translated subsequently into Hebrew and ultimately translated in to English, and he talks about the land of Israel, the promise that God gave the Jewish people, the great gift that we were given subsequent to the decimation of six million Jews. It's called Kol Dodi Dofek. Listen, my beloved Knox. It's a verse of the ancient Judaism. Uh, Kol Dodi Dofek. 
And so this is my gift to you to read it and to hug this book as I hope you hug that one and read it and read it and read it and share it and pass it on to other people because uh, the answer to that great question is something that we probably all think about whether we're Jewish or not. What's wrong with us? So on that note, uh, I just want to thank you all again. And um, Jamie reminded me that I've already given him both of these books. I, I thought I'd give him one, not the other Jamie, I owe you a book. Um, I want to personally, again, just thank every single person who came here tonight. We talked about hol Holocaust fatigue. It's incredible that you came out tonight. It's very, very special. You're heroes. We're all heroes. We got up, we took out our, our time on a busy day to come listen and learn and share and hug each other and talk about something that sadly we need to speak more about. So we are the future. Right here, we're in this room. There's 50 or 60 of us. We are the future from 21, 22 years old, all the way up to the, is it octogenarians? <laughs> in the room, we're heroes. And we don't take it for granted. And as uh, uh, coming up from New Haven and working with you to put this together in Alex's efforts, I just want to say thank you. We hope to see you again very, very soon. And if you have ideas about great subjects and topics that should be spoken about, reach out to us. <laughs> and of course, if you have another one of these somewhere in Washington, <laughs> <laughs> okay. thank you. Yes. Thank you.